right. So let's go ahead and um, get started here. Um, my name is Rich Proceda. I'm the founder of the Truth and Democracy Coalition. And uh, what I want to do now, we're going to have a presentation by Professor Joseph Dowd on philosophical therapy for political activist. And um, but first, I want to tell you a little bit about the Truth and Democracy Coalition and then tell you about some of our upcoming events. So the Truth and Democracy Coalition was formed to build a pro-democracy movement in America. We educate the public about disinformation, teach um, people to be critical of the propaganda they consume, and provide critical analysis of current events and social issues. We produce media, educational materials, hold seminars and meetings, work with other organizations, organize events and activity, all geared toward building a pro-democracy movement in America. And the coalition seeks to build communities of people of different faiths and ideologies to defend and promote democracy locally, nationally, and globally. We're going to have our first January 6th Remembrance Event Planning Committee meeting. We put an annual event on here in Whittier, California, in which we raise awareness about what happened on Jan 6, 2021, so that we can keep that in the forefront of people's minds. So we're planning our annual event to remember the attempted coup and the insurrection against the United States Congress. And it's important to remember what happened and to not let the actions of then President Donald Trump and his extremist followers um, overthrow our government and install Donald Trump as dictator for life. So in order to, re to resist authoritarianism, we must keep the events of January 6, 2021 at the forefront of people's minds as we head into the 2024 elections with Donald Trump still the front runner for the Republican nomination even now. So we're organizing an event in Whittier. We're going to help people organize events in their hometown. So join us on July 16th at 2 p.m. by registering at tinyurl.com slash Jan 6th, 2024. My name, Richard Proceda. I'm an author, attorney. I, I wrote a book on um, global perspectives on social issues about pornography. I'm the leader of the Truth and Democracy Coalition. I'm going to lead a discussion about women, relationships, politics, and life. And we do this on a monthly basis. In our, and this will be our third nonpartisan red pill men's group. And women are welcome to attend too, and they do attend. Um, and at this meeting, we're going to begin our book study of The Rational Male by Rolo Tomasi. And we're beginning with the first section of the book, The Basics. So to register for that, go to tinyurl.com slash redpillmen. And then um, check out our discussion about what's wrong with men or part one of that discussion, at least. I'm going to be putting out the whole thing and it's entirely the whole hour, hour and a half. But you can check out the first part of that presentation at our YouTube page, and you can get that at youtube.com slash at Truth and Democracy Coalition. And when you go there, remember to like, share, and subscribe to our page. So today we have um, Professor Joseph Dowd, a philosophy instructor at California State University, San Bernardino, and he's going to teach us logic-based therapy and address the need for progressives to reclaim self-improvement. Uh, Dr. Dowd is licensed by the National Philosophical Counseling Association as a philosophical consultant. He's a professor of philosophy um, at Cal State University, San Bernardino. And as a ph philosophical consultant, what that is, is basically a therapist who uses philosophical reasoning to address emotional problems. And in his, this presentation, he's going to explain, explain logic-based therapy and how you can use it in your own life. Um, so it's this LBT, logic-based therapy, is especially useful for people uh, who are involved in politics. It helps to diffuse anger, defensiveness, and other emotions that can cause the political dialogue to degenerate into a shouting match. And with its focus 
He's also focused on Asian philosophy, and he's concerned that many left-wing intellectuals have turned against the self-help and wellness industries. So left-wing intellectuals, they, they make good points when they criticize self-help and awareness and the prosperity gospel and so forth. However, by abandoning self-help and wellness, the left creates a void that's being filled by right-wing intellectuals like Jordan Peterson, and a lot of what we're doing here is to sort of fill those voids so that people don't turn to authoritarianism and don't turn to conservative intellectuals if we leave this um, opening, a vo this void, what um, Professor Dow calls it. And maybe you can talk a little more about that. But I'd like to introduce Professor Joseph Dow. Welcome, Joseph. Hi. Thanks for the introduction, Rich. Um, so do you think I should uh, just get started now with the presentation? Yeah, yeah go ahead. Just get started. And um, there you go. And okay, me... everyone. Um, well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the meeting. Thanks for uh, coming to see me speak. Uh, Rich, can you see my, my screen share? All I right? can see it. I can right. see it. Okay. Um, Okay, well, let, let me just get started then. Uh, I'm going to lay my cards on the table. Politically, I'm a leftist. I know that not all of you would describe yourselves as leftists, but I hope that this presentation can be helpful for everyone, regardless of political leanings. First, let me explain why I'm giving this presentation. The 1960s hippie counterculture embraced Asian and New Age spiritual ideas. Meanwhile, conservative Christians rejected those ideas. A lot of today's self-help and, quote, wellness, unquote, culture developed from those ideas. As a result, self-help and wellness used to be dominated by left-leaning or at least liberal people. Now, on the popular level, that's still true today. If you visit a New Age bookstore or a meditation retreat, you're more likely to encounter Democrats than Republicans. But among intellectuals, it's a different story. I mean, when's the last time you heard a left-wing intellectual talk about the importance of self-improvement and building character and self-discovery and... Uh, you know, slaying your dragons and all that stuff. When's the last time you heard a left-wing intellectual talk about that? Uh, in fact, many left-wing intellectuals have turned against the self-help and wellness industries. For example, many left-wing intellectuals have criticized the Western meditation industry. This industry teaches people to use Buddhist-style meditation to reduce stress. Now, it isn't hard to see why politically aware people might have a problem with this. By its very nature, this approach shifts responsibility away from the system and onto the individual. If you're stressed out from work, it isn't the system's fault. It's your fault for not meditating enough. Left-wing intellectuals want to change the system. So they criticize the meditation industry for shifting attention away from the system. I think that left-wing intellectuals make good points when they criticize the self-help and wellness industries. However, by abandoning self-help and wellness, the left creates a void that's being filled by right-wing intellectuals. One example is the conservative psychologist Jordan Peterson. Some of you have probably heard of him. His self-help advice and spiritual philosophy have helped many young men. These young men have become his followers. Over time, Peterson has become increasingly right-wing. So many of his followers have fallen down the alt-right rabbit hole. Here's the thing. People especially, I think, young men, need self-help and wellness. They need something to help them explore their inner worlds and navigate their struggles. And they need more than just ordinary therapy talk. 
They need a robust philosophy of self-improvement and something that we might even call spirituality. If they don't get that on the left, then they'll turn to the right. Now, I don't have a complete self-improvement plan or spiritual philosophy to share, but I do have a tool that might help you take a first step toward a journey of self-improvement. I'm licensed by the National Philosophical Counseling Association as a philosophical consultant. Uh, as Rich said, a philosophical consultant is basically a therapist who uses philosophical reasoning to address emotional problems. To be clear, I'm not a medical doctor and I'm not qualified to treat psychiatric disorders. To receive my certification, I was trained in something called logic-based therapy or LBT. In this presentation, I'll explain LBT and how you can use it in your own life without needing to visit a philosophical consultant like me. I think that LBT is especially useful for people interested in politics. LBT helps to diffuse anger, defensiveness, and other emotions that can get in the way of political dialogue. Okay, um, now I'm going to uh, start going over how LBT works. Um, there's a, a, a whole kind of theory behind LBT. So we need to um, get into the theory a bit in order to stand, understand LBT. Okay, so first of all, um, LBT rests on a certain theory about the structure of emotions. According to LBT, um, for each emotion, there's an object, an object of the emotion. That's, that is whatever the emotion is, is about or directed at. So if you're angry, the object is what you're angry at. Or if you're sad, the object is what you're sad about. Okay. Um, and the emotion consists of that object plus a reaction. I'm going to label the object O and the reaction R. Okay, so here are just some examples. Um, if the emotion is anger, then the object O is going to be some action that someone did. And the reaction R is going to be condemnation of the action or of the person who performed the action. Uh, if the emotion is guilt, then the object is a moral rule that one thinks one is violated. Okay? And the reaction is condemnation of oneself. Okay? Uh, if, the, if the emotion is depression, the object is an event or situation, presumably a bad one. And the reaction is a bleak perception of one's own existence. Let's, let's put it that way. Okay, now these are just a few emotions. Obviously, obviously there's, these are many more, but I'm just giving you an example of the structure of emotions. Okay, um, now, <clears throat> again, if the, uh, if the emotion is depression, then uh, the object is some event or situation. So, for example, um, let's say you have some middle school um, student who is depressed. And let's say that they're depressed because they think that all their peers hate them. Okay, so the object in this case is all my peers hate me. Um, and the reaction is going to be a bleak perception of one's own existence. So let's say that this kid uh, thinks that they're worthless. Uh, so the reaction is I am worthless. So in this case, the depression consists of the object, all my peers hate me, and the reaction, I am worthless. Okay. Um, okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay. So now um, here are the six steps of LBT. These are the six steps that um, a philosophical consultant like me would apply when helping a client. Um, but there's really no reason why you can't apply these six steps to yourself. I mean, you don't really need to visit a philosophical consultant uh, to use these six steps. The first step is identify your emotional reasoning. Well, um, 
I'll explain what that means in a moment. Uh, then you identify a fallacy. That is some mistake that you're making in your emotional reasoning. Uh, the third step is to refute the faulty step in your reasoning. Okay, So once you identify a fallacy, uh, that will tell you that there's a problem with one of the steps in your emotional reasoning. And so then you want to, um, in your own mind, uh, refute that step. In other words, come up with some example or some evidence that disproves that step in your reasoning. Then you're going to identify a guiding virtue. This is some virtue that can help you to avoid um, that kind of faulty reasoning that you were committing. Um, fifth, you want to adopt a philosophy that promotes that virtue. And sixth, you make a plan of action uh, to kind of put that philosophy into action. Um, okay, so that's just a very quick summary of the six steps. Uh, now let's uh, go into them in some more detail. Again, the first step is to identify your emotional reasoning. Now, again, according to LBT, an emotion consists of an object and a reaction. Um, and the emotional reasoning behind an emotion has the following structure. You've got a rule, a report, and a conclusion. The rule is if O, then R. Remember, O is the object, R is the reaction. So it's important before you identify your emotional reasoning, you have to figure out what emotion you're you're struggling with and figure out what the object of that emotion is and what the reaction you're having to that emotion, uh, to that object is. And so once you figure out the object and the reaction, you can figure out the rule. The rule is if O, then R. The report is O and the conclusion is therefore R. Now that it's probably a bit abstract, um, but an example will clarify what I mean. Okay, so let's go back to our depressed middle schooler. Um, they think all their peers hate them, and as a result, they feel that they're worthless. Okay, so again, the rule is if object, then reaction. The object is all my peers hate me. So the rule is if all my peers hate me, then the reaction is I am worthless, then I am worthless. If all my peers hate me, then I am worthless. That's the rule. <laughs> That's kind of in the back of their mind. And then there's the report. The report is just object. In this case, the object is all my peers hate me. So the report is all my peers hate me. Okay. So uh, if you put the rule and the report together, you get, if all my peers hate me, then I am worthless all my peers hate me. And obviously then we get the conclusion, therefore I am worthless. Okay, hopefully um, that makes sense. If you have any questions about this, obviously we can, we can go back uh, to it during the question and answer period. Okay, so that's just an example of identifying your emotional reasoning. Now, the idea here is not that you that you necessarily have these steps all explicitly worked out in your mind when you're feeling an emotion. No, it, it, it's just that this is kind of, this is what's kind of lies behind your emotion, right? And you want to kind of bring it out so that you can examine it. Okay, now the second step is to identify a fallacy in your emotional reasoning. Now, remember the emotional reasoning involves a rule and a report and a conclusion. Okay. Um, now, some fallacies have to do with rules. Um, now, here I've listed various fallacies that are kind of recognized within the field of LBT. These aren't necessarily the only mistakes that people could make in their emotional reasoning, but they're some of the most common. So demanding perfection is when you have a rule that basically says unless every if everything if if anything is imperfect then oh it's it like life is horrible right <laughs> like i just can't I, I can't stand it right if if things aren't perfect 
Um, bandwagon reasoning is when you have a rule that says something like, you know, if everyone thinks this way, then I should think this way too, right? And you're, you're jumping on the bandwagon. The world revolves around me is when you have a rule that says, well, if, if I believe this, or I think this way, or I feel this way, then everyone should too. Um, obviously, that can be a, a real hazard um, when you're uh, when you're involved in discussing politics, right? Because it can be very easy to think, well, if I see things this way, then anyone who doesn't see things this way must just be <laughs> must just be a bad person, right? Um, awfulizing is when you think, well, if uh, if this bad thing happens, then it's uh, it's the most horrible thing possible, right? You awfulize it. Um, damnation is when uh, you say, well, if someone does something bad, then, you know, they're worthless or I hate them, right? And you can damn others. You can damn yourself. Um, uh, you can even damn the world, right? Uh, you might think, well, if, if, these bad things are happening to me. Well, then the, you know, this, this, this world is just awful, right? That that's also a form of damnation. Uh, dutiful worrying is when you think, well, um, if there's this problem or potential danger, then I must worry about it. Right? Uh, even if you're not really doing any good by worrying. Okay. So those are just some fallacies. Uh, um, there are also fallacies of reporting, like oversimplifying reality or distorting probabilities or blind conjecture. That's when you just guess, right? Without, without sufficient evidence. Okay. Um, these have to do with your, the report in your logical reasoning, in your emotional reasoning. Okay. So now let's, let's give an example of identifying a fallacy. So we go back to our emotional reasoning. If all my peers hate me, then I am worthless. All my peers hate me, therefore I am worthless. Okay, so there are actually uh, a few fallacies uh, that this rule is committing. One is bandwagon reasoning, because the person is thinking, well, if all my peers think I'm worthless, then I should think that too, right? I should just jump on the bandwagon, go along with what everyone else is saying. Uh, another fallacy is damnation, right? Right. This person is saying, well, if there, there are some problems with me, maybe I'm not that popular, I'm not good at making friends, then, then uh, I damn myself. I must be worthless. Right? Uh, the, you could also say that this rule is committing the fallacy of demanding a perfection, that you know, if, if my life isn't perfect, right? if, say, uh, I'm not popular, then uh, you know, my life is just worthless. My life is terrible. Okay. Uh, there are also some problems with the report. Uh, it's quite likely that this report, All My Peers Hate Me, is oversimplifying reality. Uh, it might be that a lot of the person's peers hate them. That doesn't mean all of them do. Saying, well, all of them do, that's probably an oversimplification. Um, that person can probably find some people who like him if, if he tries. Um, distorting probabilities. I mean, okay, so may maybe like, let's say you're new at school <laughs> and um, everyone you've run into has kind of disliked you. Uh, well, if you if that happens enough time, you might conclude, well, uh, well, obviously I, um, everyone must hate me, but is it really that likely that everyone hates you uh, or are you distorting probabilities there? Okay, so you... Uh, so you identify a fallacy in one of these steps, either the rule or the report. Okay. Um, the, the third step is to refute the faulty step in your reasoning. Now, we saw that actually, in this case, both the rule and the report uh, are flawed. Uh, so here, here's one way you could refute the rule. The rule says, if all my peers hate me, then I'm worthless. Okay, so, uh, you know, I'm not expecting everyone to know about this, but I'm a philosophy instructor. So uh, there was this ancient Greek philosopher named Socrates. And um, actually, everyone in his hometown ended up hating him because he asked all these annoying questions. In fact, they hated him so much that they condemned him to death. 
So everyone hated Socrates, uh, but he wasn't worthless, right? Uh, he was actually one of the greatest philosophers uh, who's ever lived. Um, the report is all my peers hate me. Uh, well, actually, okay, it seemed like everyone hated Socrates, but Socrates has a, had a play, had a student named Plato, and Plato liked him. Um, so it's quite likely that even if it seems like everyone hates you, not not everyone does. Okay, now obviously, I, I wouldn't expect you to come up with an example involving Socrates, but you can think of your own examples and right, uh, to disprove the faulty steps in your reasoning. Okay, so that's step three. Step four is to identify a guiding virtue. A guiding virtue is some virtue that can help counteract whatever fallacy you're committing. So let's say that you're demanding perfection. Well, the guiding virtue that you should work on is security. That means feeling secure with yourself and with the world, right? So that you are able to embrace the world or yourself, even if you aren't perfect or the world isn't perfect. Um, if your fallacy is damnation, like you damn someone or yourself uh, for doing something bad, well, then the 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 philosophical the, the the guiding virtue that you should work on is respect, respect for yourself, respect for others. Um, if your uh, if your fallacy is awfulizing, you tend to like whenever something goes wrong, you think it's the most awful thing ever. Well, you need to work on the virtue of courage. And 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 so on, you know. Uh, so there are there are different guiding virtues for different um, different fallacies. If your fallacy is the world revolves around me, right? You think everyone needs to think and feel the way you do. Well, you need to work on empathy. You need to work on seeing things from other people's point of view. If you tend to oversimplify reality, you need to work on being objective, on uh, looking at all the facts instead of oversimplifying. If you tend to make blind guesses, then you need to develop the virtue of empiricism, of looking at factual evidence before coming to conclusion. Uh, and if you, um, if you tend to jump on the bandwagon, then you need to work on the virtue of independence, um, you know, uh, thinking for yourself. Okay. So, for example, if let, let's look at this rule, if all my peers hate me, then I'm worthless. OK, so we saw that that's committing the fallacy of bandwagon reasoning and uh, the the guiding virtue would be independence. So um, you should judge yourself based on your own standards rather than others standards. Right? Don't jump on the bandwagon. Um, it also this rule is committing the fallacy of damnation. Uh, just because you aren't perfect, you're damning yourself. You're saying you're worthless. Well, you need to work on respect, specifically in this case, respect for yourself. You need to recognize your own inherent value. Okay. okay. Um, step five is to adopt a philosophy that promotes the virtue. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all these different philosophies. There are probably some terms here that you haven't heard of. That's fine. Um, <clears throat> the point is there are lots of different philosophical theories and viewpoints out there that you can draw upon, um, to support whatever guiding virtue you're working on. Um, and if you don't know much about academic philosophy, that's fine. I mean, you can come up with your own kind of personal philosophy. Uh, you know, you, you don't really have to read any books, uh, to come up with a philosophy to promote your guiding virtue. Um, and finally, uh, step six, make a plan of action to put that philosophy into practice.